the rise of podcast. There's over 600 million blogs globally. As much as po the popularity of uh, podcasting is on the rise, we're still in single digit millions. So there's still lots of upside for the opportunity. And let's not forget the portability of podcasting. You can listen to it while you're working out, walking the dog, doing housework in the, in the, in the car. We can't do that with YouTube or we shouldn't be doing that with YouTube if we're driving the car. Um, one of my favorite uh, podcasts is Stuff You Should Know. And the reason I bring this example up is because we often get so hung up on, I don't know, what are we going to talk about? What should we, what kind of content should we produce? I want you to know that there's ideas everywhere. And this is a great example. They spent 41 minutes talking about the Etch-a-Sketch. You know, going retro, bringing back memories from our childhood. If they can talk for 41 minutes about an Etch-a-Sketch, we've got stuff we can talk about, I'm sure. They've talked about what makes us yawn, how barcodes work, how yo-yos work, how igloos work. When you are pressed for time, let's talk about safety pins, turbulence. Does the five-second rule really work? And my favorite... They spent an hour talking about the ballpoint pen. Not just the ballpoint pen, but the fact that there were two competing inventors seeking a patent for the ballpoint pen. We know Parker Pen Company, but do we know the person that they were facing off with in terms of conflict? They found an hour's worth of content to talk about the ballpoint pen and the, you know, the, the war for a patent. The top 10 most listened to podcasts, and this is US data, Joe Rogan, The Daily, Crime Junkie, This American Life, Stuff You Should Know, which we just talked about, My Favorite Murder, Pod Save America, Office Ladies, Serial. There's a lot of true crime threaded through there, so uh, some skewing there. I won't say anything. Um, but the genres, comedy tops it out, news, true crime, top sports, health and fitness. So. And I'm not saying that you have to be in these, these uh, genres to find an audience. This is just showing you the top. There is an audience for you know, pretty much anything you can think of. Here's the Canadian list. But, um, they don't have an amalgamated one, so this is for Spotify versus Apple. Joe Rogan is exclusive to Spotify, so you're not going to see him on, on anything else, and, and he's number one on Spotify for that reason. Um, uh, armchair expert, Dax Shepard. Some of these have come out of nowhere, like Dak Shepard, you would not have thought of him as a podcast host, but he's phenomenal. It's driven by his curiosity, and it's less than five years old. If you know Neil Patel and Eric Sue and the marketing school, they just had a podcast recently talking about their podcast. They're about six years in when they first started, 30, day, 30 downloads a day, maybe 50, maybe 60 but they stuck with it six years later. They uh, convene every two weeks and they do a batch of two weeks worth of episodes, six to eight minutes uh, in length, which leads me to the debate about how long a podcast should be. They're on the, the you know, extreme end where they're six to eight minutes, if that. Joe Rogan on the other end, two to three hours. The sweet spot seems to be about the 25 to 30 minute mark. But again, if the conversation is good, people will listen. And you know, Joe Rogan, I do not sit there for three hours listening to Joe Rogan. I, I'll come in and out, Dak Shepard, they're an hour and a half sometimes. You consume uh, as you see fit. But like I was saying earlier, the projections are that podcasting will continue to grow. But if you're going to dip your toe in the water of podcasting, this is not something you dip your toe in for a month. You need to be thinking about a multi-year commitment. That's going to be potentially a hard business case uh, to make. And also have to figure out, am I going to be doing one episode a week, one episode a month? Don't bite off more than you can chew. Do a batch and then start distributing it. Like Incorporate it into your workflow so it's manageable. Because you do want to train your audience to know when is the new episode coming out. So much time is spent on YouTube, cat videos, skateboarding dogs, etc.
That's right. That's pretty much all there is to say. That is the first video ever uploaded to YouTube. So the bar was really low right out of the gate, okay, about the quality, and that was a member of the YouTube team, and that's how it all began. And we've sort of come full circle. Now, in the case of the most viral videos and so on, they don't have to be highly produced. We are forgiving production value for access, for humanity, and so on. So in the U.S., 62% of users access YouTube daily. It's the world's second, second most visited website after uh, Facebook. Nearly 700,000 hours of video are streamed on YouTube each minute. And 81% of internet users globally have access to YouTube. Now, uh, just touching on um, uh, Facebook for a moment, when you're thinking about your content, you're thinking about video content, 81% of videos watched on Facebook are watched without audio. So you need to think about captioning. You need to think about storytelling without audio, just as, as a uh, backup. And video content gets 1,200% uh, more shares than text or images combined, which we'll drill into more in a moment. We often get asked uh, by uh, prospective clients, should we have a YouTube channel? And my, my answer is usually, well, it depends. Are you intent on having a channel where you are releasing a new episode every week? And they go, oh, no, 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 that's, that's, that's too much. No, then you're going to have a channel where you're housing video files, and you're going to use that just as a repository, and then you're going to embed your YouTube videos whenever you make them into your website to give the traffic to the website. Don't overburden yourself with, I must you know, uh, do, uh, have an episode out every Thursday night or whatever, if you can't sustain it. There's no point in overburdening yourself. So if you are going to have that level of production once a week, once a month, every other week, whatever, and you can sustain it, then by all means have a channel. But if you can't, then just use it as a place to house your videos and then use them to be embedded into your website. And as well, the, the shorter videos, especially under a minute, are you know, easily uploaded natively to the platforms because the platforms give preferential treatment to native uploads, which we'll talk about more in a moment. This year alone, according to Cisco, 82% of online content will be video. So nothing to, you know, I still write stuff, but I'm not, I, I can't put my emphasis on a, a blog alone. And to highlight that, in terms of what kind of content uh, people want to see from brands, there's video on the left, 54%, and then there's blogs over on uh, way over there on the right, uh, and further to that, content in PDF form. So, for those of, and myself included, for those of us producing eBooks for downloaded uh, for downloads as a gated piece of content, it's not very popular, but video content is. But I'm not here to say then abandon your blogs, abandon your ebooks, and so on. Make sure it's part of your overall mix. I'm the former head of social media strategy for the Royal Bank of Canada. If we produced a report from an economist and that report was a PDF that people could download, fine. But we could also interview the economist and say, okay, give me the five highlights from that uh, report. That could become a video. That, those five highlights could become a listicle that's a blog. And then if they want to read more detail, they can go to the PDF. I'm, I'm wanting to emphasize here that you work smarter rather than harder with your content. And don't, don't just think about one piece of content as one piece. Think of it as a, a, a foundational asset and then start extrapolating from it. Think more about your content in terms of it being educational, that it provides value, and that it's helpful. Those of you who know Jay Bear from Convince and Convert, great phrase he said to me when I interviewed him. Is your content so good that people would pay for it? Good test. Lee Auden from Top Rank Marketing, when I interviewed him as well, said, are you trying to be the best answer with your content to the questions you believe your uh, clients or the prospects are asking? I interviewed the director of marketing for Indium Corporation. Um, they were featured in a book called Content Rules. And for many of you who don't know Indium Corporation, that's totally fine. They make solder paste. I know, try to contain your excitement. 
They make solder paste. Let me repeat that. The material used to connect or attach electronic components to assembly boards that go in electronic devices. They have blogs written by a number of their engineers and their motto is content to contact to cash. And their head of sales told the director of marketing, the social media generated leads are the most qualified. So if Indium Corporation can produce content about solder paste that is profitable to do so, do not get hung up on what would we say, what would we do about content because they can write about solder paste, surely there's a story we have to tell. I wrote an article on LinkedIn six years ago saying, don't wish happy birthday on LinkedIn. How many of you have received a very unge uh, ungenuine happy birthday on LinkedIn from members of your, right? So I was, I'm not saying don't wish happy birthday. I was, don't click the default button that sends me the default message about happy birthday. My argument was, customize the message, take two seconds. Hope you're well, happy birthday, have a fantastic day. Let's uh, connect, it's been a while. Something like that. That was the spirit of the message, but the provocative headline was, don't wish happy birthday on LinkedIn. Six years later, I'm still climbing in the number of views. So don't dismiss evergreen content. If you've produced a piece of content that resonates with people and it hasn't expired, it still has legs. And this still keeps chugging along because people still have birthdays every year. And that, like I said, you know, 2016, uh, and it still keeps chugging along. Many of you are probably not giving much emphasis to Twitter um, as part of your marketing mix, and that's okay. Um, every time there's a news like Will Smith at the Oscars, Elon's talk of purchase and so on, it comes back to life. It is the default social news channel. At RBC, there was an RBC Twitter account specific to journalists. Had next to no engagement, but over 700 journalists followed that Twitter account solely for corporate news. That was its role. And Twitter still continues to play that role of uh, where news breaks. But what I want to highlight here, this is a two screenshots amalgamated, um, the rise of the use of Twitter threads. So if you have a listicle blog article, like five things you need to know about X or 10 things you need to know about Y, well, uh, Islo here, he had 10, uh, uh, he'd written something up basically, instead of a blog, he broke it into a thread of tweets or a tweeted thread of the 10 different tools he uses as a freelancer. And each uh, part of the thread was with a graphic screenshot of the different websites of the tools that he was using. And then the final piece of the thread was a summary with links to those websites. So I'm not saying you, know, you should do this with every tweet, but if you're trying to like recalibrate, rejuvenate, or like what more can we be doing on Twitter to spark engagement or disseminate information, change it up a bit. This capability does not exist on any of the other social platforms. You can use carousels on Instagram, you can use sliders on, on LinkedIn. Twitter doesn't have that, but Twitter has threads. It's just an idea, it's not a strategy, it's just a tactic. But if it helps you, know, you change things up, then give it a try. Facebook. Largest reach globally, and here in Canada as well, but organic reach is approaching near zero. If you're starting a Facebook page today and you don't have a paid budget set aside to get it off the ground, you're gonna find it extremely challenging. I'm not representing Facebook, so, but that's just the state of the nation. So, and as well, if you don't have a well-established baseline audience, getting your content seen is challenging, but you still cannot ignore its reach. It's the biggest of all of them. So it really should be part of your marketing mix, even B2B. And, uh, and you know, we have B2B organizations come to us and say, well, you know, LinkedIn is our, our platform. And I say, I love LinkedIn, I owe my career to it, but it's 800 million members globally and single digits, millions are using it every day. Now, if you're, you are using it every day and you're posting content, you are highly visible, but there's a huge delta between the active members and the overall audience. It's nowhere near being the number one most used uh, site like Facebook is. 
So you can still reach a B2B audience through Facebook. What kind of content is resonating on Facebook? Like I was saying earlier, video. A post with just text and the link is one of the least performing types of posts. Enhance that with a visual graphic, but you'll do even better if you have video incorporated. What was the last piece of content you shared or responded to? It caused an emotional response. It was inspirational, it was funny, maybe it made you angry, I don't know. Um, the, the study by Bustumo found, you know, yes, highly produced, uh, polished content did well, but the lower production value, the user-generated content did even better. So do not get hung up on production value. I mean, we, we, I, I'm not, I'm a, I have a degree in film production, so I have an appreciation for high quality you know, filmmaking. I get it, it has its place, but sometimes like, you wanna have a, have a balance of highly produced, uh, but as well, some of the lower, uh, view, look no further than TikTok or you know, lower production value. But having said that, Facebook still right now is beating TikTok for short form video, again, just because of its reach, but in 2021, TikTok was the most downloaded app in the App Store. We're gonna spend some time on TikTok as well. The most popular, again, this is, if this informs your content strategy or genres, the most popular Facebook fan pages as of March 2022, Facebook, big surprise, Samsung, Christian Ronaldo, Real Madrid, so we're seeing a mix of sports, we're seeing a mix of brands, Coca-Cola, uh, FC Barcelona, Shakira, Tasty, which is, from, I believe, from BuzzFeed. So it's recipes, the, the short form videos, like where the time-lapse cooking. Um, Vin Diesel, for those Vin, <laughs> Vin Diesel fans. Uh, China Daily, Eminem, Mr. Bean, YouTube, Rihanna, um, uh, Justin Bieber, and, and so on. So quite a, a diverse mix. So, as I mentioned, TikTok was the most downloaded in 2021. It's the sixth most used social platform in the world and, and rising. Uh, over 1 billion active monthly users, again, com compared to LinkedIn. I'm not here to slag LinkedIn, it's, it has its place. I wish there was more activity on LinkedIn, and it, but it is on the rise. Um, and it's more popular with Gen Z users in the US than Instagram. So, and if you don't have a TikTok account, I'm not here to say jump on TikTok and start producing. At a minimum, if you have a brand that you are responsible for and you haven't set up a TikTok account, please do so just so it's not taken by someone else. Swan on it. True Social. Um, someone went on True Social, set up the Walmart account, and they weren't Walmart. And if Walmart wants it, they've got to figure out a way to get it back. So I recognize your brand may not be as well known globally as, as Walmart, but that's the kind of stuff that can happen on emerging platforms. So a couple of the communities I wanna talk about on, on TikTok. I saw a corporate deck from TikTok for their advertising, and they talked about the largest single community on TikTok was Mums of TikTok. And part of the reason of its growth and its, uh, in terms of existence is the pandemic. A lot of moms find themselves at home, doing uh, mul wearing multiple hats, uh, responsible for the kids, teaching, still doing work, running the household, et cetera. And they found a community on TikTok, a place they could go and laugh with, a place they could go vent, et cetera. And it just exploded because of that. And it's the largest single community on TikTok. I've seen other examples like of, uh, autism TikTok, where it's a mixture of people that are on the spectrum, using the platform to educate people to garner better understanding. Um, there are some parents of, of um, uh, people on the spectrum who can't speak for themselves. The parents and, and caregivers are being advocates and using the platform for education as well. It, it's fascinating, the distinct communities that have risen on, on, on TikTok as a result, uh, and teacher talk. Now, teachers are doing a great job of I mean, they're, they're protective of the children in their, in their class, they're not revealing who they are or whatever. You're only seeing the teachers, but you're getting a portal into what a day in the life of a teacher in class, the, 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 uh, the humor of it all and, and the pressures that they go through. It's been an interesting lens on, on what they're doing uh, in class and, and not just here in Canada. So uh, anyway, there's, 
I could go on with the number of communities that have sparked and, and grown on TikTok. While TikTok is on the rise, um, don't discount Instagram. And many of you probably aren't. Um, probably all experiencing similar things to what we are, which is it continues to garner the highest organic engagement, excluding TikTok for the moment, of all of them combined. If you're going after the millennial and Gen Z audience, um, this is the predominant platform because they were on Facebook first, and then their parents showed up, made it less fun. Now their parents are showing up on TikTok, and soon it'll be less fun there. And then we'll have to the the one on the on the, the horizon now is be real. We'll see how that plays out. Um, and but. Instagram is under threat from TikTok. They are watching videos for the TikTok watermark, some shooting a TikTok and then they're downloading it, recording it or they're porting it over to Instagram. Now there's services out there and sites that where you can strip the TikTok watermark off of it so that you can put it onto Instagram so that shh, nobody knows. <laughs> but it's again, it's working smarter rather than harder. It's, it's repurposing your content, uh, but I mean, there's a lot of jokes on TikTok about, oh, you know, when your friend on Instagram sends you that video you saw on TikTok from three weeks ago. And, you know, start doing some A-B testing. Produce a particular video, put it on TikTok, put it on Instagram uh, as a reel, and see what happens. I have, uh, had a co-op student working for me a number of summers ago who's an influencer. She has hundred and some thousand followers on uh, Instagram. She has a million followers on TikTok. And she's been on Instagram way longer. So there's still an opportunity on TikTok to explode an audience. But I'm not here to say, like, forget everything and just focus on TikTok. It is still a nascent platform here in Canada. But no matter the platform, we are competing for people's attention. We want them to stop scrolling. We want to, you know, just pause your thumb for a second. Give me a moment two inch you know, by three inch screen is where we are reaching them predominantly. This is just a screenshot, but this is from a, a DIY video on YouTube where someone took a piece of wire and they twisted it around a knife blade and created a DIY peeler. It has over 90 million views. I made a peeler mom and I put it on YouTube. That's it. That's, that's, the, that's the concept. I made a peeler and I put it on YouTube. And I show you how to uh, peel a cucumber. And 90 million views later. So again, there, there are ideas for content everywhere and I've got more examples here in a moment. So I was mentioning earlier, um, YouTube is the, you know, one of the top two most visited websites in the world. No shortage of, of consumption of content, but I want to differentiate between the videos that are housed there, and if you want subscribers, you want views, there's nothing wrong with that. But you want to also control your, the journey of your um, audience. And so if you have the opportunity to embed your content in your website to control where they're going and send them there instead of YouTube, I recommend doing so. But also there's the trade-off. If you're looking for engagement, natively uploaded videos get more engagement on the, their respective platforms um, than a shared link from YouTube. It's just the nature of the beast. And it began here. Facebook discovered during the Ice Bucket Challenge, this is just a screenshot, that when people were sharing, uploading the video onto uh, Facebook and then they were tagging others, the virality of the tagging and the fact that the video was native there just exploded engagement. And that was a trigger for them, and they've you know, given, been giving preferential treatment to native uploads ever since. This is the So this is another step. I'll see what you're doing. Start on top and bottom. It's a cute goal too. The food only has starch on the bottom, that's toast. Obviously, this is toast. So this and this. After this, that's just toast from the inside down. Let's review. This is toast, and this is the sandwich. Hot about the sandwich. Sweet calzone, creamy calzone, carnival calzone, and the carnival sandwich calzone. That's right. Fried chicken calzone. There are exceptions like salad. These are salads. 
take these now. Then there's a case. The Zanzi came. It says this totally. So there's a software company using the explanation of a sandwich to promote their software. Humor, and again, um, you know, a very, a very simple concept. We can all get our head around what a sandwich is, uh, and it worked for them. And um, but again, it's just when you're trying to think, well, so we're a software company. I'm sure, you know, I know there was a group of people in a room that said, you know what would be great? Let's take sharks and tornadoes and make a movie out of it. And similarly, there's five of them. Um, they said, let's make a video about a sandwich. Uh, and it, well, I forget how many millions of views. And this is still relevant content to them. So give yourself some more latitude for ideation about the kind of direction that you can take with your content. Okay, so you're this? Yeah. But you want this. Yeah. Okay, so in order to get that, you have to do this. <laughs> that is a TikTok video from the corporate account of LinkedIn. It's a millennial sitting on the couch of their apartment and um, doing content. Now, how many of you work for organizations that would not have thought five years ago that that would fly? Yeah. I can assure you at the bank, no. But that's all changed. The, you know, like I said, we are trading production value. We are now shooting things on our phone. As I mentioned, I have a degree in film production. I went to film school because they, uh, the, the one I chose had a brand new building with all this brand new editing equipment, which is all now resident on my phone. Okay, I can fit in my pocket. That's how much things have changed. And so, you know, well-known corporate brands are, are having to figure out how to navigate this new world. And, and so, you know, instead of a nice corporate video with the LinkedIn logo coming in and, and et cetera, they uh, are doing content like this. They are writing the, the memes and the trends that are, ha and you know, sometimes brands can show up and feel like a, you know, the Fed's showing up at Coachella and, and being rejected. Um, but there are avenues into uh, content uh, where you as a brand are still, still relevant. This is a local example, um, and I just love it. I hope you do too. Um, the, there are content ideas everywhere. I popular the demand here where you drive to a station purely on bikes, on the and that's less cash. Pros, McDonald's. Cons, you might get thrown over like a way to get to McDonald's. Before I can say, you are stationed in Piper, you are right by the car with access to daylight, you are up to down the track of the train, you are going to get a hand in Last and definitely leads to the green station, I found an exit other than ever the right one is one. You might end up in the wall by accident, or leave that weird step up and smell like pee. One out of ten. Now, um, that's part five. <laughs> it was so popular, he's on part five, rating subway stations. Now, he's a, he's a Brit, he's moved here from, from uh, the UK, he's a comedian. But the fact is that he found something to talk about that has been so well received, he's on to the fifth it, uh, uh, episode of it. And, uh, you know, there is, you know, there's, there's content ideas with, within uh, all of us, and there's, you know, you can just look around like, you know what, this subway station, Queen Station, um, kind of sucks. And I, ha you know, I have to agree with some of his assessments. Um, here's another Canadian example. How many of you have, on TikTok have seen the crying filter? Okay. So it's a filter that you, the, you point the camera at someone and it makes them look, so for context, their faces are not deformed, it's a filter. The reason I, I show this one as well is that when organizations um, like Instagram and TikTok are 
often used to, to, to convey employer brand. It's nice LinkedIn has a, you know, can have a career page on your company page and so on. But increasingly, Instagram and TikTok are being used to show employer brand, the humanity of the organization, especially culture. And provided your colleagues are willing is to bring them into the content. Make them ambassadors and advocate for your, your brand. You know, throw a phone up in front of them and say, listen, if you're willing to, just, you know, what was your first day like? Uh, there's a company called uh, 360i. Um, it was a U.S. example. What they did was they, they produced a video series, and they're on season three now, where they have a new hire, and they take them through their first um, right from the day, day one, right through to their first performance review on video, that you follow their journey being onboarded. Now, they, they don't reveal any you know, corporate information, et cetera, but they're on season three. It was proven to be that popular. But again, conceiving of an idea, well, you know, we could do something different. And from an employer branding, culture, et cetera. Now, it's a commitment. It's, you know, high production, et cetera, but it's worked for them. And um, here's another uh, employer branding example that I love. This, how many of you know uh, Lumberland? They make baseball bat beer mugs. That's all you need to know. Play along if you want. I can see that. Wow. I knew it was going to be I've seen that video before. No, I'm not going to get it. Who is that? Uh, oh, God. Oh, my God. I'm so going to get this. Parker. Who's talking about your performance? I was actually. With an AI system. Who's going to be tired? Who's actually retired? He was just like, I'm stopping. He's going to be sure tomorrow. Interesting. That's a hint. They have over 1.5 million followers on their TikTok channel, and they got have all their videos categorized by different, basically, um, quizzes, and they'll uh, throw up, you know, a picture of an egg with a line under it and the word easy, and it's like, solve the puzzle, it's eggs over easy. And they have garnered this tremendous following just having fun at the office, doing stuff like this. So again, it's sometimes we get so caught up in, well, we can't do this, we can't do that. Just shoot it, and then you can debate about it afterward. I'm not saying shoot it and then put it out there, but shoot it first and then decide. Like, ask any content creator. They have a thousand more drafts in the, on their phone than they do in terms of what they've uploaded. Just try it, okay? So this is what their uh, account page looks like, and they've got different categories. So if you want to go deep on, select, uh, I guess, the celebrity from their yearbook photo, you can, have, yeah, you can go down a rabbit hole on their channel. You want to look at puzzles, they put up um, you know, the, the two-dimensional drawing of a country without their name on it, and they'll guess the country. Uh, that looks like Panama, like stuff like that. Um, what I was mentioning earlier about uh, video content uh, being shared without audio, this is an example I just love, telling a story without saying anything.
quite a few different stories happening in a very short period of time. All different people in different life events that have a financial implication or have a financial connection. Uh, that's from Well Simple. Here's another example from Well Simple. How many of you uh, have to send out press releases for your organization? Okay. So we've done a lot of work with publicly traded mining companies, and press releases are required as part of you know regulation. And I will say this, and I've said this to clients. They are the, you know, for their, in the case of mining, it's the driest <laughs> form of content you could dream up. But, for example, here, when Wealth Simple reached $4 billion of assets under management, they added something to enhance the announcement. Something as simple as this, an animated GIF of, you know, a stairwell of, uh, from four of all the zeros. We've done videos with CEOs to say, tell us why this press release is noteworthy. Again, making sure it still complies to regulatory requirements and so on. Use your press release as a jumping off point. What else can you do? Is there a provocative number? Or is there a provocative uh, thing that you want to pop out? Make a visual graphic to put, um, you know, incorporate it into the social post. Like I said, a video clip of the, uh, the CEO uh, or media spokesperson, an animated GIF like this, you know, augment the press release. The press releases are necessary, I get it, but you don't have to just stop there. You know, turn it into a more robust piece of content. We uh, were involved in the web series Hello Again on CBC Gem, um, and it's uh, the executive producer and co-creator is Simu Liu of Marvel fame. And it got a review. And for one of the reviews, we created a visual graphic. We pulled a quote out uh, from the reviewer and we still directed traffic to read the full review. But instead of just tag them the link, you know, go have fun, we branded it. Now you can't do it, you have to be careful on how many times you put your brand on something that isn't yours. Um, you know, when we work with clients for Remembrance Day, we absolutely insist you don't put your logo uh, on the visual that goes out on Remembrance Day. That's our personal value. It's like you don't brand a tombstone. That's just our, our take on it. So here, um, it was just a, a review of the series. It was a positive review. Uh, we wanted to, um, again, just instead of just sharing text, the link, um, give it a more of a visual enhancement. Uh, for International Women's Day, Many of the, Seema aside, many of the people involved in the production are women. Um, one, two of the executive producers, the director, the cast and crew. So for International Women's Day, we had a whole series of images and that was it. Those were the only assets we had. So uh, we turned it into something. <laughs> The reason I share that is simply when you, depending on the assets you have available to, uh, to you, is that you can do more than just, you can do more with it. There's lots of options, there's lots of you know, templates and tools out there that you can take something and repurpose it and bring it to life, make it turn it into rich media uh, as opposed to something static. This, and the reason I bring that up is this idea of we need to move away from one and done. We've all worked for organizations likely where, oh, we wrote a blog, we published it, we tweeted it out once, and now we're moving on to, the, to start working on the next blog. Why did we, that's a thousand dollar tweet. Why did we put all of our time and energy into that content and share it once? If it's evergreen, keep it in rotation. Leverage you know, what you already have, repurpose as much as, as you can, reformat it. You know, if there's some seasonality to it, can you 
revisit it and give it a bit of a refresh, update with some uh, some newer data. I recognize you know you have a mixture of evergreen and time bound content, um, but you know we are the war for attention is on, so we need to be emphasizing richer media because that's growing higher engagement. But I, I use this framework. Um, uh, to just you know, highlight the, the example. So there's nothing, like I said, there's nothing wrong with writing blogs and they're, they're conducive to SEO and so on. I'm not here to say stop doing it. What I am saying is to use it as a foundational asset for your approach to content. Compile a bunch of, of, the, uh, of the blogs, turn it into an ebook, and you can choose to make it gated or not. But again, it's repurposing the content. There's tools like Lumen5 that'll turn a blog, you upload the text, it will pull in stock imagery and you can decide, and, or it'll just animate the text and suddenly my blog is a video stemming from the contents of it. Um, there are tools out there that will read your uh, article and turn it into a podcast. There's a, a website called Descript that will do transcription. I can now read a piece of text in my own voice and it'll record it, and then I can give it new text, and it will read that text in the voice I just gave it. So now I can do my own audiobook without having to do my own audiobook. Um, if there's some key points, like a listicle or you know, key uh, numbers and, and, and key concepts you want to convey, uh, turn it into a, a few slides, slide share, or just a slider for, uh, for um, LinkedIn and a carousel for Instagram. If it's an obvious listicle, turn it into an infographic. Ten things you need to know about X, five things you need to know about Y. Um, after over a certain period of time, incorporate you know, the best of into your newsletter, or your newsletter gets one blog from you and two or three um, complimentary uh, or um, uh, augmenting articles from some uh, industry sources. Don't just stop there. Use it as a, you know, as a jumping off point. So I'm not here to promote my show. I'm just using this as a, as a concept, but I have a podcast where I, I talk. It's a show for and about entrepreneurs. And I try to live the idea of low production, high value. Um, you know, it's just recorded on Zoom. But the reason I, I, I want to show you that Going back to the example I gave you about YouTube, so I record it, goes on a podcast platform, it gets pushed out to iTunes and to uh, Spotify, et cetera, but I have a, a dedicated podcast page on my website that I send people to instead. And they can, all the episodes are there, my website's getting the traffic, um, and then I go a step further. How, how many of you are familiar with audiograms? Okay, a few. So. As much as you might go into the podcast business, I want you to think about let's record it on Zoom or something like it, or Riverside FM is, is a rising platform. I record it on video, so I now have video assets. I, and I have the audio file as well, so I have my audio assets. And then you can do something like this. So these, these iterations of the business are uh, essential to survival. You know, we, it's not a no a business will pivot. And it's only by surviving the one pivot to the next that we've been successful. I get to say, yeah, my business is 15 years old. Um, if I had been married to what we did, you know, we are this kind of business, this is what we do because this is what I want to do, uh, there's no way we could survive more than two or three years. And I see that with other entrepreneurs too. That They'll come in and express an idea of, oh, I want to start this, and I think this is really needed out there. You know what? Don't be able to buy it. It's not a business. Uh, you can't sell what you think you want to offer. You don't have anything. So I have my master episode, of the full episode of my podcast, or the full episode of my video, but then I, I have it cut up, and I have 6 to 12 audiograms, 6 to 12 video clips that I can send out as teasers. But also, I have those in rotation. And they're small enough files that they're uploaded natively, because I can't upload the full episode to, cer to uh, certain channels. So again, I I'm squeezing as much juice out of the lemon as possible. This is the same, this is what uh, the uh, video clip version of it, I'm not going to play it. So 
the, the, my point is that even the autogram is visualized graphically. So in the social feed, it pops. Because if it just looked like a line, like an audio player, and there was no graphic there, there's going to be less likelihood of, of pressing play. But there's the headshots, there's the title of the show, etc., and then you see the play button as well. And then this is my guest, Lisa Shepard, you know, a, a, a longtime entrepreneur, uh, and this is the video version. And again, it's like a minute clip and highly consumable. So um, still uh, talking about blogs. So this is Wealthy Works, um, founded by a friend of mine. This is their blog, but it's maybe hard to see, uh, but I've pointed out in red there, they make it from an accessibility. You can listen to their blog instead. They've embedded an audio file above it. So again, it's just another form of content. It's you know, improving the accessibility to their content, um, something to consider. Again, if, if you've got the capability. So some closing thoughts. You know, are you being consistent with your content efforts? And I, I, I can speak firsthand, it can be challenging to be consistent. Are you certain that people see your content as uh, being valuable? Are you, you know, are you the best answer? You know, your content, your audience is hungry for content. Are you feeding them? I hope I've illustrated with the examples I provided that the bar is low. And that's not a criticism. It's meant to encourage you, like, don't get hung up, that it's got to be pristine. Excellent is the enemy of the good. Um, involve your colleagues. You know, brainstorm. Lots of ideas. You may find... Uh, Tyler uh, Lasari from Vidyard yesterday, one of his sales reps was had his own TikTok channel, was just a natural on camera. He's now leading their overall video content because he was just, he had the personality for it. There's likely someone in your team that would just be a natural fit for it. Uh, and you know, they may either raise their hand or um, just you know be self-evident. So, you know, that threads into... Always be on the lookout for content opportunities. The next time you're being interviewed, uh, you're on a panel, a virtual panel, put your iPhone or your uh, Samsung or whatever up beside, record you answering the questions. Yes, your webinar might go out later, but now I've got content on my phone that I can cut up. I can do a title card that says question X, and then I can play my answer. And I can be basically uh, scripting my thought leadership. And um, I just wanted to mention, and uh, sorry to be too promotional, I've got a book out um, about scaling social media across enterprises. It does talk about marketing, but it also talks about the non-sexy part of social media, which is dealing with legal, developing a social media policy, compliance, uh, operationalizing, um, you know, v um, vetting vendors. Uh, evaluating social media tools, et cetera. So um, hopefully uh, it might be a helpful resource to you. Um, I have a table out there if you want to, we're going to be low on time if you want to uh, come and chat and, and uh, have any questions answered. And we will close there and I'll say thank you very much for your time this morning. Is there time for questions, Aaron, or no? Okay. Right over here. Hi, I'm Colleen, and I'm working with an internet company here in Ontario. Um, something that I always struggle when it comes to offering people the ability to watch a video but not listen to it, when I do automatic captions, that actually ends up taking up a lot of my time because sometimes it just misinterprets what it is, and I spend a lot of time editing it. But in your experience, does that really affect the experience of people who are watching it, if they can still kind of read between the lines? I was just wondering your own experience with dealing with that. We have some clients that have market commentary that goes out every week. So there's this, we're on a bit of a factory treadmill, and they will get hung up on, I don't think the comma should be there. Or I think, and we're talking about captions. I think the comma, we're like, speed this is about like just ship it um but to your point if you if depending on what the content is so if it's commentary about market commentary and there's a risk of misinterpretation and the whole regulatory and compliance then 
there has to be a bit of emphasis or scrutiny on making sure we are displaying what was said. Um, but again, to your point, if there's a low risk of misinterpretation and it's more they're just skimming the read, then I wouldn't get so caught up on it. And yeah. I, I know you're biased. It's like the, the, the answer that everyone hates, it depends. Fair enough. Yeah, because yeah, mm -hmm. I think just in terms of getting organic content out there, we've just transitioned over to using Reels. We've had great success with it, but that's what's eaten up my time and in turn has stopped me from putting in the closed captions. So. Well, mm -hmm. um, like tools like Lately and Descript are, do a good job of like parsing videos and, and automatically captioning them, but you still need to go back and uh, you know read them and watch them at the same time. But with things like Descript, if you take out the ums and the ahs, it tightens the videos once you've removed the text as well. So like I said, like you you can turn yourself into a pretty robust production house with just a few tools. That, that Those are great tools, yeah, because just the Instagram tools are not very friendly in terms of doing that quickly, so yeah. that's part of the issue. Don't get me started on, create, <laughs> on Creator Studio. I guess. Well, thank you, appreciate yeah. it. Okay. <laughs> Other questions? Oh, over here. So what happens if no team member wants to be part of the social media strategy? And then you have... Do you mean on camera? Or yeah. Just as a, okay. Yeah, on camera. Mm -hmm. And But you have one guy that is willing to be on camera. Mm -hmm. But then the company is worried that you then have a face to that brand. Mm -hmm. And if that person ever leaves, then it's it's almost like the clients are confused, the messaging kind of gets right. construed, you name it. It goes back even earlier than um, being on camera. There was someone who um, had a hybrid Twitter account. They were the spokesperson for their brand. But so it wasn't quite a personal account, uh, but they were the evangelist for their brand and then they left the company. That company sued them for the Twitter account and their followers, and the company won. So, and, and not to promote the book, but I speak about this in the book too, is when you are deciding about whether or not you want an ambassador or an evangelist or whatever, everyone has to be clear on the role, expectations, and you are an ambassador or an evangelist for this company, and that may come to an end for whatever reason. Um, you know, so, and the company needs to understand, you know, we need to be prepared for, you know, Mary or Bob may move on and we will have to replace them. They replaced Steve on Blue's Clues and the world didn't end. So, um, like, we need to be prepared for that. Ideally, if you can have more than one person, that um, it, it does have some, you know, dynamics that uh, can be concerning. But yeah, if, if uh, or you know, just as well, like people leave and the world doesn't end. So the change, okay. You know, you know, Mary was here last week. It's it's me now. So love me or hate me, I, I'm, I'm the new voice or the new face. So I hope I hope that helps. Thank you. No problem. Anyone else? Oh yes. Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay, so I often in the back, but I'm really loud. Just to help. <laughs> Hi. How are you? I'm well. And you? Good. Thank you. I'm also a film major, by the way, so awesome. We'll um, talk about that later. Yeah, we will. A uh, quick question for you. What about testimonials? So I've mentioned before, I worked for a school, and mm -hmm. I recently had, you know, parent testimonials are very important for schools. Yep. And I had a parent who was with us about 15 years ago. We had a testimonial on the website, and now we're trying to get testimonials that are videos. And the parent says, oh, you know, we no longer go to your school and we would like our testimonial removed. So what do you think about testimonials and, you know, something like a fluid business like that where people come and go? And uh, would you think those are important? Because I know when I have parents come in, they say, do you have somebody that I can talk to about the school? Mm -hmm. So for us, it's very important. But I don't know how it would fit in the social media world with all of this. And if it's something I should even be looking at doing or not. I mean, I was, there's a platform out recently where you can push basically like a Zoom notification, for lack of a better description, to someone and say, just click on and record your testimonial. So it removes the, the friction from getting a testimonial, but it still comes back to the fundamental is, 
I think testimonials are worth it. Um, someone was mentioning yesterday about reviews, or maybe it was at, at DigiMarket in Chicago. Make sure that you know if there's a willingness to be transparent, make sure that not all the reviews are positive, so that they're more credible for the ones that are positive. There was a, a bank in the, in the UK called First Direct. They would display their sentiment scores in real time on their website for all to see. And they had a rotating banners of comments from customers, including negative ones. They were that willing to, uh, they were willing to be that transparent. Now, school may not be so, but at the end of the day, I still think there's value in, in testimonials. If you want to mix it up a bit where it's, you know, create an animated GIF, like have them send in their testimonial in text in an email, create an animated GIF like the uh, example from um, Well Simple. If they're willing to go on video, then record it. Uh, if it's just, uh, you know, make a static text graphic, that way you've got different formats, different uh, platforms and channels. I'll tell you that helps. Uh, was, was there a question over here? All uh, right. Thank you very much for your time. Enjoy the rest of your day.